a seat, find a place to stand, maybe kneel, maybe lay. If you're joining us online, we're so happy that you're here. We're coming with our worship. Our whole lives are a picture of worship. And God is holy. He is holy in his temple. He is holy in this temple. He is holy in your temple. You are the temple of the living God. Because the living God lives in you, resides in you. He breathes in you. He dwells in you. You are in him. And he is in you. Yeah. Thanks, Lord. So come on in. Find a spot. You are so free this morning. If you're at home, I want to encourage you to be free. Not just to maybe sit on your couch or wherever you're watching, but maybe you want to get up and dance or you want to lay on the floor. However you want to worship. We're going to worship this morning like we do every morning, like we do every moment of every day. And maybe if worship is a little bit different to you, maybe you're unsure of what that looks like, I want to encourage you to simply let go and let your heart, allow your heart to worship the Lord this morning. I was reading in Mark um, this morning before I left my house, and one of the things that really struck me is... um, It said that when Jesus went away to pray, it said he gave himself to prayer. He wasn't praying to mark something off, to do a check mark like, oh, I prayed for this. I did my uh, list this morning. He gave himself to prayer. We give ourselves to prayer. We give ourselves to worship. We give ourselves to Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He gave himself to us. And so we give ourselves to him as an offering. We say, yes, Jesus, even now, you can allow your worship just to erupt. Allow it to come out of your heart, out of your mouth, out of your body, out of every pore. Jesus, we lift you high. We give you ourselves, God, in worship and in praise. We give ourselves to you, King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the holy, holy, holy one, God of heaven and earth. The whole earth is full of your glory, and we will worship you, God, today in spirit and in truth, every moment of our lives. Bless you, Jesus. Bless you, Jesus. Let's continue worshiping. Before I call, before I ever cry, you answer me from where the thunder hides. And I cannot run this heart I'm tethered to With every step, oh, I collide with you And like a tidal wave crashing over me Rushing into me, your love is fear I can't escape Tearing through the atmosphere Oh, your love is fierce You cannot fail The only thing i found Is through it all You never let me down, yeah You don't hold back Relentless in pursuit
love is fierce. Oh, your love is fierce. Oh, your love, it looks like something powerful. And oh, your love is fierce. And oh, your love is fierce. And you knock me off my feet. Oh, come and knock us off our feet like a tiger. I will live. 
He is worthy of worship simply because of who he is. Because of his character. His character is good. We bless you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yeah. Thanks, Lord. We honor your presence here, Holy Spirit. We thank you that you are with us. Yeah. Thanks, Lord. We're going to continue worshiping the Lord even as we greet our friends and our neighbors. We're going to carry this with us because we're worshipers every moment of every day. Thanks, Lord. Even as you get up maybe to greet other people, be loving and honoring of each other. If someone's new, ask them first. Yeah, but go ahead, stand up, love on somebody, continue loving on the Lord. If you're just sitting in the presence of the Lord and you are totally overwhelmed by his love, you can stay there. Thanks, Lord. Thanks, Lord. If you're online, we welcome you as well. Go ahead and greet somebody. Maybe send them a text. Put something on the feed. We're happy that you're with us as well. Yeah, God's doing beautiful, beautiful work in our hearts this morning. Thanks, Jesus. Thanks, Jesus.
If you're online wondering what we're doing, we're being family. This is what family does. We're the family of God. So we're loving on each other, encouraging each other, speaking truth about who we are. Thanks, Lord. In just a moment, we're going to stand up and declare some good things over our tithes and our offerings. And I want to remind us, just like we carry worship everywhere we go, our giving is an act of worship. When we give financially, when we give our love, when we pour that out on people, when we give prophetic words, when we declare and pray over people, when we give eye contact, Love on people, yeah. So much beauty going on back there. Be in the family of God. So, so beautiful. If you are new, we want to welcome you this morning. So good to have you. There is no compulsion to give in the offering this morning. We just want to welcome you to receive all that God has for you. But let's all stand. We're going to declare, again, the reason that we declare truths over our tithes and our offerings in just a moment here. Uh, There it is. The reason we declare is because there's something that happens when we say it out loud. We can believe in our hearts, but there's something that happens when we actually say it. You can believe someone um, when, I take that back. You can say that you, when, when you love someone, this is what I'm trying to say. When you love somebody, you can just love them. But when I tell you, I love you, and then I act it out, something happens in that person's heart where they really begin to believe you. This is what Jesus did. He came, he declared, and he gave his life. When I say, Teresa, I'll love you like crazy, and then I do things that are loving, it's that combination of knowing and speaking and doing Yeah, that makes it come alive. So here we go. Let's declare this together. I declare that God is good and is a rewarder of those who earnestly seek him. He is a great father and I am his daughter. His love for me is unconditional, unsearchable, unbiased, and endures forever. He gives in abundance of overflowing. His plans for me are always good. His thoughts toward me are always full of love. He rejoices over me in joyful songs. Because of his great love, I will not be moved. I will not be shaken. No weapon formed against me will ever succeed. I am a conqueror and a beloved child of the king. I am empowered, strengthened, purposefully designed, and strategically placed right where I am to impact the kingdom of God, bringing heaven to earth, spilling God's favor, good news, and goodness to all nations covering the earth. Amen, amen, amen. Yeah, thanks, Lord. Yeah. Aren't you just so glad you go ahead and take a seat? Our ushers are coming around. If you gave your offering up here, so beautiful that we get to worship the Lord. Give him, yeah, give to him every moment of every day. I was just going to say, aren't you so glad that you can do a redo? Sometimes you have something in your head, and it just doesn't want to come out of your mouth for whatever reason. Yeah, and you can just repeat it. It's beautiful. So thanks, Lord. Yeah, thanks, Jesus. Now, well, we'll let them do it back there. Our pastor is going to come and give a good word. Thanks, Lord. Yeah, it is. So I'm not sure how this is going to go. I'm going to give you a fair warning. Um, We say this often, but I think we have to continue to remind us of that church is not where people come together and just hear something that they like to hear. If church becomes a place where all we do is just come to hear something that we like to hear, and in the end we walk out and nothing changes, then we have to ask ourselves, why did Jesus come? Jesus didn't come to make a church or make a building. He didn't come to have people just gather together.
the scripture talks about that Jesus only did what he saw the Father do. And he only talked about what he heard the Father say. And as I'm, I woke up this morning all week long, God is waking me up early in the morning. I'm interceding and praying. And we all know that God is joy. But he's immensely saddened by what his church is not comprehending. And that his children are not seeing him and not following what he actually is doing. We're supposed to bring heaven to earth. And the responsibility of the church is to bring light and to be salt. And I just sense his heart today that it's grieved by the, by the laxical, daisical attitude of the church and his kids to actually represent him by who he is. And I, I had something totally different prepared for today, but obviously we're not doing that. So I find it interesting. He took me uh, uh, this morning to Genesis chapter 1. And it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface and deep dark. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And then it says, And then God said, Let there be light. I believe we're in a situation exactly the same where God says, I need you to be light, not darkness. You're not here to partner with light, uh, with darkness. You're here to partner with light. And then he brought me to this other uh, verse that I'm going to read, and I want to give you the, the, somehow the connection to this. If you, uh, if you read in Genesis chapter 4, there's a happening, the first of all on earth, all earth that happened, but it had a profound influence on earth. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? He said, I don't know, he replied. And so arrogant. Am I my brother's keeper? How arrogant. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out from the ground. There's a murder that happened. There's a murder that happened. And he says, your brother's blood is crying out from the ground. The earth is saturated with the blood of his brother and it's crying out. And then this is what God says. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work your ground, it will no longer yield its crop for you. You'll be restless wanderer on earth. And I believe that's a prophetic word. I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. In America, we've come to a place, and in the world, we've come to a place where we are okay with child sacrifice. We call ourselves believers, and we are okay with child sacrifice. And I believe that's the most egregious sin. That is where, in 400 years, when Abraham was going to the land, he says, the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full potential. And one of the things they were doing is child sacrifice. How is it that America, that was chosen a land by God, we've come to a place where there's a disagreement in the church about child sacrifice? And how is it? And the only time the sins have to be come to a place and a level where they are exposed. 
And there is no way that we can say we're followers of Jesus Christ when one person says, I'm okay with child sacrifice, and the other person says, I'm not okay with child sacrifice. We are followers of Jesus, not followers of culture or tradition or anything else. And I want to play this. I'm not sure it's going to, I'm going to hold it to my face because I want you to hear the video about a law, somebody who's actually defending the law of abortion. And I want you to listen to what he says. And if it doesn't work out, we'll have to do it somewhere else. But I'll try this and see if it works. Uh, yeah, how, late, I mean, how late in the third trimester could a, a physician perform an abortion if he indicated it would impair the mental health of the, of the woman? Or physical health. Okay. okay. I'm, I'm um, talking about the mental health. So, I mean, through the third trimester. The third trimester goes all the way up to 40 weeks. Okay but to the end of the third trimester. Yep, I don't think we have a limit in the bill. So, um, where it's obvious that a woman is about to give birth, she has physical signs of, of, that she is about to give a birth, would that still be a point at which she could request an abortion if she was so certified? She's dilating. Uh, Mr. Chairman, that would be a, you know, a decision that the doctor the physician and the woman. I understand that. that. I'm point. asking you if your bill allows that. My bill would allow that, yes. How have we come so far? And I'm not grieved by that. We call ourselves American, the land of the free. And we've allowed the devil to take hold. And we're sitting in a church. And the blood of American ground is crying out. For justice. How is it that we're okay with that? How is it that we are okay with that? That the land that was actually built on godly principles, got hijacked because the church wasn't living out what it was supposed to live out. And this is not, we're not accusing anybody. All we're saying is we're calling the church accountable. That means me and everybody else included. This is not a blaming. I really felt that the Lord has called call me into his confidence and he said, do you want to know what I'm doing? Do you want to see what I'm doing? Do you want to hear what I have to say? Then I want you to be a part of that. And he's inviting me in. The inviting in doesn't come with shame and guilt. The inviting in comes with an invitation of God saying, listen, look at my heart. Because if you want to bring heaven to earth, you have to be gripped by what grips me. You have to be broken by what breaks me. We cannot just stand idle by. There is a fight that is going on in the spiritual realm. We talk so much about the end times. The end times, what's going to rise up is the people of God who are followers of Jesus Christ. There is no room for lukewarm mentality. And then the Lord brought me to Malachi, and I just want to read this. Um, I printed it out because that way it's easier. If you have your Bibles, you can open it. I'll walk through all of Malachi real quick, I guess. And I just want to bring the one verse up that the Lord spoke to me uh, throughout this week. He says, Matthew 15, 8. And he says, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. And he, broke, he said that Marcus... There is so much religion going on in the church and they honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me. And what does that mean? I was going to teach on that but obviously that's not where I'm supposed to go today. So I'm just going to go through here. Malachi chapter 1, it says, The Lord of heaven's army says to the priest, A son honors his father and a servant respects his master. If a father and a master are there, the honor and respect I deserve. Where is the honor and respect I deserve? That's what God's saying. Where is the honor and respect that I deserve? You have shown contempt for my name. 
But you ask, how have we shown contempt to your name? This is what God is talking to the church today. He's not, please understand me. This is not a conversation where God has his finger out, his eyes are fire, he's getting like irate, his veins are popping. That is not the conversation. The conversation is not a, a, a condemning conversation. The conversation is, is an inviting in when you see your dad sitting there and he's sad. And you come into the room and you say, Dad, what's going on? And his heart is broken and you're sitting beside your father who is crying, who is upset, who is, and he's sitting there and he says, come, I will show you why. I know many of us never had a dad like that. A dad that is grieved by the actions of his children and a dad that is composed in his heart to love his children, not to condemn and not to shame them. But it's a dad that sits on the couch and his kids come in and he, they see, they're aware of his dad. And he's sitting there and they ask, God, dad, what's going on? I want you to picture in your mind, that's the way the conversation is going this morning. It is not a conversation of, of um, being ticked off or anything else. It's a conversation that God is inviting you because he says, I want to give you a glimpse. Because Jesus says, I only do what I see the Father doing. Well, uh, we have to start seeing what the Father's doing. And today the Father is sitting on a couch inviting us in and saying, do you want to have a conversation with me about what I am really feeling? He says, you have shown contempt how have we shown contempt for your name? Verse 7, you have shown contempt by offering defiled sacrifices on my altar. Then you ask, how have we defiled the sacrifices? You defiled them by saying, the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When have you given, he says, um, when have we defiled the sacrifices? You defiled them when by saying oh, the altar of the Lord deserves no respect. When you give blind animals sacrifices, isn't that wrong? And is it wrong the offer, uh, uh, to offer animals that are crippled and diseased? He says, try giving these to a governor and see how pleased he is, says the Lord of the heaven armies. If we would treat our friends on Christmas and buy them used toys... And give it to them. How many friends would we still have? If you give your employee just the rest of your, you know, not even the best, but just maybe 10% of your ability, how many of you would still be working? We've become an institutionalized church that has no concept of God, or how to listen to God. If you talk to Christians that do you know how God speaks, most of them will look at you with a blank stare. I don't know. How does God's voice sound? And we don't even know. We are delighted in following rules and regulations instead of living in relationship. And the concept that God actually is saddened by, by what we have become at times is inconceivable because we only see God as a judgmental God, as a God that tells us off. If we would treat our best friend the way we treat Jesus, I don't think we would have best friends. Go ahead, beg God to be merciful to you. But when you bring a kind offering, why should I, he show favor to all of us? Ask the Lord of heaven and earth. Have I, how I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that these worthless sacrifice would not offer it. God uses all things for good for those who love him. I believe that part of COVID has something to do with God is saying, I'm sick and tired of church services that all they do is you're just feeding yourself. You're just feeding your own comfort. You're asking for your own comfort, but you're really not asking to be comfortable in me. 
And God is asking, well, where is it going to change? Well, I believe the rise of the church is here at hand. But in order for that to happen, there is repentance that has to happen in our hearts of what the things we are allowed to. And you go, well, I didn't allow it. Well, if you didn't speak up, you allowed it. How I wish one of you would shut the temple door so that these worthless sacrifices could not be offered. When I'm speaking, I'm not speaking in a judgmental way at all about churches. I'm talking to church in general. We have made church a theatrical expression and an experience. Where worship teams are amazing. Where teachings, our presentations are amazing. Where art is just phenomenal. And we choose churches by the best presentation, like a theatrical experience. And the more theatrical and the more pump it has, the more people flock to it. And the question is, how is that what God is feeding you, actually amplifying in your life? How's it changing that this nation and many other nations in the world look at child sacrifice as it's okay? How can we look on that the family is being destroyed and we say it's okay? How can we look on and say that that what God created male and female can be distorted by the enemy? How can we look on? How can the church look on? If we say we love people, why would we allow that? That's why the father is sad. He said to bring heaven to earth. That means we have to bring heaven to earth. That means we have to start speaking up. We have to start loving people. Not just come and be in a group of people and then go back home and not talk to anybody. But my name is, and I love this, he still says this, but my name is honored by people of other nations from morning till night. There's still the churches, there's still the believers where God is being honored. And I believe, I pray that you are one of them. I pray that we are still one of them, that God is still honored. All around the world, they offer sweet incense and pure offerings in honor of my name, for my name is great among the nations, says the Lord of heavens. I wonder where those churches are sometimes. Malachi 2, the purpose of my covenant with the Levite was to bring life and peace, and that is what I gave them. I want to propose that you and I are the priests, because the Bible calls us priests, so we are the priests. And he says, the covenant was with the Levites to bring life and peace. We're supposed to bring life and peace wherever we go. We're supposed to influence with life and peace. That required reverence from them, and they were greatly rewarded Revered, sorry, they were greatly revered me and stood in awe of my name. And they passed on to the people the truth of the instructions they received from me. They did not lie or cheat. They walked with me, living good and righteous lives. And they turned away, many away from live, lives of sin. The words of a priest's lips should, uh, should preserve knowledge of God. And the people should go to him for instruction. For the priest is the messenger of the Lord, the heaven's armies. But your priests have left God's path. The church has left the path of what God has instilled in the priest to do is to bring life. We have aligned with the spirit, the demonic spirit of child sacrifice, of abortion, of uh, the gay and lesbian lifestyles. That's not normal today. Breaking down the family. We said, it's okay, it's just, you know, so what? How have we come to that place? 
Your, your instructions have caused many to stumble into sin. You have corrupted the covenant I made with the Levites, says the Lord. You want to know why God's sad? It's because his church is not representing him. He says very clearly in um, Revelations, I'll have it somewhere. I'll get there later. I want to have it. Now I'm on a search somewhere here. Since I'm not going by what I'm teaching, I just know the. I want to read it. Revelation 19.10. For the essence of prophecy is to give a clear witness for Jesus. We have to be giving a clear witness of Jesus. That is what we ought to do. We are called to give a clear witness of Jesus. You and I are the priests. You and I are the believers. You and I are the representatives. We are to give a clear witness of Jesus. The clear witness of Jesus doesn't say... Abort your children whenever you want. It doesn't say you can change your sex any time you want. It doesn't invite that type of decadence. And there's many more. And by the way, this is not a political speech. If you, want, if you believe this is a political speech, then you don't understand the Bible. The Bible is clear on statements like this. And the church is supposed to rise above this. Malachi 2, 13. Here's another thing you do, he says. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, weeping and groaning, because he pays no attention to your offerings and doesn't accept them with pleasure. Why would God... Say, yes, I want to answer you when we are actually promoting child sacrifice. Why would God answer anything if we're promoting that he didn't create us in the beginning, male and female, that he, forget, that he kind of messed it up? Why doesn't the Lord accept my worship? I'll tell you why. Because the Lord witnessed the vows you and your wife made when you were young. But you have been unfaithful to her, though she remained faithful to your partner. The wife you married, uh, the wife of your marriage vows. Didn't the Lord make you once with your, one with your wife? In body and spirit, you are his. And what does that mean? Uh, what does, and what does he want? God, godly children from your union so you guard your heart, remain loyal to your wife and your youth. For I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. Do, to divorce your wife is to overwhelm her with cruelty. The church has fallen off the cliff. It's fallen off the cliff. We somehow lost something here. And when we're really interested in bringing heaven to earth, like, the, like Jesus taught his disciples to, the, to pray, he says, to bring heaven to earth, we've got to find out what's going on up there. Ephesians says, we're seated in the heavenly realms. This is not a joke. This is true. You are. You have access. And we have to bring heaven to earth. And the only way we bring heaven to earth is by finding out, God, what are you doing? And today, he's sitting on the couch, so to speak, and he's inviting you in. He's inviting you in. You've wearied the Lord with your vows. You've wearied him by saying that all who do evil are good in the Lord's sight. Well, you know, what are we going to do with people who, who just, you know, poor people who are, you can't excuse 
child sacrifice. You can't excuse sin, decadency. You can't excuse jealousy. You can't excuse unforgiveness and bitterness. You can't excuse it. You can't. And then these people ask, and Malachi says, and you're weird by asking, where's the God of justice? Then Malachi 3.8 says, should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me, but you ask, what does it mean that we ever cheated you? You have cheated me with the tithe and offerings. You're under curse, for the whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, I will open up the windows of heaven for you. I think the church in the Great Depression, they were feeding and helping people. And then the laws came in, well, no, let the government take care of it. And now it's like, almost like the church. We don't take care of it, but we just give to the church and, hey, we give you something. We won't even give you 10%. We'll just give you a little bit and hope that that would just, you know, if you want pay. We have people calling all the time to the office. Can we have money? Can we have money? When is it that we can start taking ownership? and saying we did not represent Christ. The way Revelation talks about we all owe people a representation of Christ. This is our fault. That America and the world doesn't see Jesus, it is our fault. It is not anybody else's, it's not God's fault, it's our fault that we didn't stand up. We didn't do our part. We chose to live in our comfort instead of in that what God has called us to do. We like our life to be just live in our house, have our car, go on vacation, have my money, have whatever I want to do. We want to live in our comfort. And millions of people are slaughtered. Millions of babies are slaughtered left and right. And we just go, well, it doesn't touch me. All these filthy sinners are having abortions. All these filthy sinners, there's no love. We, we don't love them. We don't care about them. A heart doesn't break. God created them and a heart doesn't break. And I believe this is the wake-up call the church needs. This is the wake-up call for the great revival. This is the wake-up call the church needs. Because I believe what's happening is the Lord is saying, this is going to bring to clarity those who are for me and those who are not, uh, not for me. Those who in name are for me are not for me anyway. But those who are in life and in values and in heart are for me. It's not by chance that God said, the kingdom of heaven is like somebody who wouldn't and found the treasure in the field. When he found it, he went home and sold everything because the value was in the treasure that he found. And the church, you and me, have to come back to that value, who Jesus is. It's not about the house. It's not about the cars. It's not about your job. It's not what people say about you. Don't get offended. Who cares what they say? It is about that we found the treasure, Jesus. And he is the one. I will open up the windows of heaven. I'll pour out the blessing so great you won't be able to have room for it. This picture means something different, but if you look at it, there it is. God is going to open the heavens. He is about to do that. And you're going to find the people he's doing it with are sold out for Jesus. And they're not sold out the way you think they are. They're not the holy rollers. They're not the pharisaical Christians. They're the prostitutes. They're the decadent. They're the liars, the cheaters that are coming to Jesus. And they are the ones who are going to be restoring the runes. It's not the religious anymore. It's not the ones that have high positions. And plenty of those are going to be a part because they have those positions because they're honoring God. But it's not all of them.
Matthew 15, 18 says, but the words you speak come from the heart. And he says, and that's what defiles you. It's because your heart speaks stuff that you shouldn't be speaking. Oh, I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. Put me to the test. Your cross will be abundant, for I'll guard them from the insects and diseases. Your grapes will not fall from the wine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven and armies. Then all nations will call you blessed, for your land will be such a delight, says the Lord of heaven and armies. You have said terrible things about me, says the Lord, but you say, what do you mean? What have we said against you? You have said, what use of serving God? Hello? What, what's the use of serving God? What have we gained by obeying his commands or trying to show the Lord of heaven and earth that we are sorry for our sins? We've treated God with contempt in every, in every way. And the church has to rise up. And the only way back from this is by repenting. The only way back is by saying, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. How do I know that? Because I kept on reading Malachi. Malachi 3.16 says, Then those who feared the Lord spoke with each other, and the Lord listened to what they said. In his presence, a scroll of remembrance was written to record the names of those who feared him and always thought about to honor his name. That means there was those who listened to what he said, and they said, You know what? Let's come together. And then there was a scroll made out. And the scrolls were written the names of those who said, Yes, we fear God. We want to do it again the way God says. And then this is what the Lord says in 17. They will be my people, says the Lord of heaven's armies. On that day when I act in judgment, they will be my own special treasure. I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again gain, then you will gain, they will, sorry, then you will again see the differences between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And that time is coming you'll see those who walk in the empowerment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you'll see those who have name only. And we've been accustomed to those who are name only. In their house, they have in God we trust. They have verses up the gazoo somewhere. Their car has a Jesus sticker on it. But their life doesn't resemble any walk with God in power. They may know all the Bible by heart, but their life doesn't resemble the power of the living God. And the church has been accustomed to a culture of tradition and church that comes together maybe two times a week and maybe really radical three times a week, but it has no influence on society because society could have not written the laws that it did if the church would have been influential. Lot was in Sodom and Gomorrah, and he didn't work at it. He just lived there. God has put on our hearts for years to start praying and interceding for this nation. I believe this nation is in the battle for its life. And I still believe that the gallows that Haman built were for him to die on. And I believe that God is still in control. And when the enemy thought he had it all done and over, it's the only way to show the enemy's face. When God turns it around, and I still believe he is. But he needs his church to stand ready. He needs his church to now start interceding, now start praying, now start interceding. Not just for this. Because this election is not just about that. It's about America about the culture, about your neighborhood, about your, about your schools, about your job, about everything, about the culture has to start changing towards heaven to earth. And the church needs to start activating in such a way that we are all the John the Baptist going out and telling people about Jesus. And that means you're no longer in your comfort zone. That means you no longer get what you want. That means you're no longer 
sitting on your couch eating chips and watching something. And I'm not against you watching something on the couch. I do too. <laughs> but I'm saying, it becomes a life of giving it up and saying, God, all I have is yours because I already, you, I already have everything. I'm already living in the heavenly realms. I'm already there. Malachi 4.2. But for you who fear my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. That means if we confess our sins, God comes with healing. He doesn't leave you there bleeding, go, well, that was a mess. No, he comes with healing. But now I want you to take a picture again in the heavenly realms. The Lord just put that on me. He says, by now the picture you want to see is that right now you came in with God crying and saying, this is what I'm sad about. And he's gripping your heart and your heart is starting to break for what breaks his. And suddenly the moment changes where God is coming over and he's starting to hug you and he's saying, hey, I love you. Listen, now I'm coming to you. I'm going to heal you. He's not this pissed off God that just goes, well, whatever, but he's now coming over and he's saying, listen, I come here because this is not a moment where I tell you off. This is a moment where I'm hugging you and telling you, thank you for listening. Thank you for coming in. Thank you for asking what's wrong with me. Thank you for caring about my heart. Thank you for looking at my heart and saying, yes, God, I see what your heart is breaking for, and I want my heart to break for what breaks yours. That is so important. The shift is now towards us. The shift is now God saying, my heart breaks for you now, but I'm going to heal you. My righteousness is going to shine upon you. If you humble yourself, this is the, if you humble yourself, there's something, the most powerful thing in the universe is humility. When we get up from our big horse, Moses was the most humble man on earth because he, when everybody accused him, he says, oh Lord, I'm sorry. He humbled himself. Humility when you, we humble ourselves, God will rise us up. Pride is your utter destruction. Well, I think I'm doing good. Look, I'm telling you, when God speaks to me, I don't go, well, what the heck? That's a good message. I'm heartbroken. And I go, God, what do you want to change in me? What is, what, where's your finger on Where's, it, where's, the, where's the things that you're putting on me right now? Because if all it is is a great service on a Sunday morning, it's worthless. Then I just wasted it. And as much as I'm preaching to you, I'm preaching to me. And you will go free leaping like with joy, like calves let out of pasture. I worked on a farm for five years in Germany, and boy, that's the funnest thing to see. The little calves, when they start running, they don't care. They barely can run, you know. But they kick their legs, and they run, and they just are frolicking all over the place. And God says, that's what you're going to be doing. I love it when you go into the living room of God, when you come in there, and you are interested in what God is doing and what he's saying, he slowly and surely moves it towards you. And he says, I'm here to heal you. I'm here to change you. I'm here to transform you. I'm here to love on you. On that day when I act, you will tread upon the wicked as they were dust under your feet, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Remember to obey the law of Moses, my servant, all the decrees and regulations that I gave him on the Mount Sinai for Israel. Look, I'm sending you a prophet Elijah before the great day of dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. And that was the last words in Malachi. And then we entered into the 400 silent years and then we came into Jesus. And Jesus is the one who came to reconcile 
father to his children. And I believe that is still happening to this day. God is still in that mood. He's still good. He still wants these things. The question is, are we ready to say to God, yeah, we want that too? Or are we just in a place where we say, now, I think you're just having a problem with politics. And that's fine if you think that. I just know what God is talking And I feel the church has to come to a census and make decisions. God wants you to change the world. He already did his part. But he wants you to gravitate. He wants you to come to power that he designed before the foundations of the world you have. And when you enter into a relationship with him, that power starts becoming active. And it's time for us to become bold and say, God, I know that I like my comfort zone. I know I like my dreams. But I actually didn't sell everything. And I actually just visit the field where the treasure is. I just visited it. I visited it actually two times a week. And then... I run back and forth a couple times a day just to take a look at the treasure. But I don't live there. I don't see it more often. I don't kind of vaguely just look at it because I'm living more in my, in my comfort zone. And what is call, God calling us to do is the question. I'm, I'm not here to convince you one way or the other. I think the Holy Spirit is very capable of talking to you. I didn't have this planned. I had something else planned. But I think we, as a church, the Bible says in the last days, you know, if you read in Revelations, the different types of churches, there's the lukewarm ones. And it's a danger to be lukewarm. It's a real danger to be lukewarm. And God is calling the church to arise. And there's no apologies for that. There's no apologies. There's just a blatant, I'm moving this direction. And there's going to be plenty of offended people around you. And I'm so sorry if you're offended today. I'm so sorry it may not have been what you've expected it to be. But there's nothing better than being invited into the throne room of God and having seen the heart of the Father and the heart of the Father bleeding. And you're asking, what are you bleeding about? And him sharing his heart concern. Not with a judgmental attitude. You see, what we tend to do, and now we're going to give some practical application because that's important. We're not against Democrats or Republicans because we're not Democrats or Republican or independent for that matter. We're kingdom builders. And if you dare to go out there and point a finger at anybody who even has the wrong, who are the wrong everything, if you dare to even point a finger, you're no better than them because that's why Isaiah says, if you put away the pointy finger, if you put away the... We as a church are not here to point fingers at Democrats or Republicans. We're here to point fingers at ourselves where we need to grow. We need to learn to love more, to love better. We need to learn to actually hear God better and to be a part of what He is doing because it doesn't matter what the world does. If we are answering the world's problems with a world solution, it's demonic. I really believe that this is an amazing time where the church can rise up and be loving as all get out. That we would unify. That our lives would unify. 
that people would know that we're Christians by the way we love one another. That we would unify under Jesus. And there would no more be division between what Jesus does in heaven and other people see him, because there's not two heavens, there's only one heaven. And that the church will grow to become this oneness. Chapter 17 in John, where he says that we are one, that the world will become like we are one. And if this is the beginning of what God is doing, and then his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, and this had to happen this way, so everything comes to a boiling point. But God is not interested as much in the president as much as he's interested in you and personally about every single one of them. Are we getting his will? Are we seeing what he's doing? Are we into what he is doing? Not what's good for me, but are we into what he is doing? And if we're into what he is doing, that means seeking first the kingdom of God, everything will be added. It doesn't matter how it looks outside. It doesn't matter because I am completely satisfied with my King and my Lord and Savior. I'm completely satisfied living out my destiny and purpose that is not dependent on a political scheme. I'm completely satisfied and living a life for Jesus in whatever the circumstances are. I'm completely satisfied. And the only way I can start this is by humbling myself and saying, Lord, I didn't do that. And Lord, I, 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 forgive, forgive me for saying nasty things from one side to the other. Forgive us, Father, for partaking in the splits and partaking in the judgment, partaking in the, in, in the uh, judging people. We are not part of that anymore. We are lovers of Jesus Christ. We speak up for what is true and we have plenty to say about truth. No apologies on that front. But we will never accuse people and judge people in that sense. That is not who we are. That is not the kingdom way to do it. The kingdom way to do it is to love everyone. No matter who the president is, no matter who is in Congress, no matter who is in, no matter what your governor is, no matter who the cop is that pulls you over, you love them. And you humble yourself. And he will rise you up. And that is what God is wanting to do with his church today. Are we going to humble ourselves so he can rise us up? Are we going to humble ourselves to the point where we say, okay, God, our sacrifices, actually, we never did sacrifice. We just gave you our leftovers. I don't give you my heart. I give you what's left over, what I don't need. My ties just... Don't even, that's like, I pay you a tip. I'm tipping you, God. I'm not really giving you. When I give to people, I give them my used clothes. I don't go to some really nice expensive place to buy somebody some expensive clothes. I go to Walmart and Target and bless Walmart and Target. But I just buy them the cheap clothes that I actually don't wear, but I just buy them so they're dressed. There's something about kingdom mentality that has to start changing in our hearts. How about the believers? When somebody needs clothes, we go to a real expensive place and buy them some expensive clothes. How about when somebody needs food, we really buy them some good food? How about when we give to the poor, we give like Jesus is and he gives everything? How about when we give people, we give an abundance of overflowing? How about when we tip? We tip. Maybe the whole food that we ate, double again. Because he says, if you become generous, I will just... We're supposed to represent Jesus. Revelation, right? Let's represent Jesus. We're in the three percentile of the world living in America, and we act like we're the poorest people in the world with our finances. Where is it that the church has to start coming to realization that we have to live out Jesus 
We have to act out Jesus. And then signs and wonders follow that. And that is the gospel that we preach. That's the gospel that we preach. And when that's the gospel that we preach, you're going to find a Jesus that is laughing, smiling, no longer saddened by his kids because they understand him. They're doing what he's called them to do. And then this changes your neighborhoods. This changes your legislation. This changes your culture. It changes everything around us to the extent that America again becomes the land that God chose the land that, America, that God chose to impact the world. If you think America is just another state, it's just another country in the world, you're totally wrong. You're not hearing what God is doing. God created America to impact the world, to show that America is a city on a shining hill and is decadent. And that decadency needs to go so that light can shine. And the church is to bring that in. We are the revolutionary guard. We are the ones who can beat it because we fight not with earthly weapons, we fight with spiritual weapons. And when we defeat demonic strongholds and deceptions and broadcasts go out, people come to a repentance. And when they repent, they get saved and they become like Jesus as they follow Jesus. And that is what we preach. That is what our goal is, to bring heaven to earth. Lord, I just pray today that you would have your way, that this message was not something that I came up with but you. And Father, you know the way you created me, my face always looks kind of upsetting and serious when I'm talking, but Father, I really love people and I really, um, I really want to represent you. And Father, I pray that nobody is turned off by the delivery as much as they hear your word. And I pray people who are watching online and whenever they watch it, Father, there'll be the right timing. And I pray right now and empower the airwaves to change people's lives under your power and your anointing. And Father, today is 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 a teaching like every other teaching, but this is again a teaching that comes from your lips to the hearts of men and women and children. And this would be a game changer again. That we are people who bring life, not death. And we're here, Father, to fight for the next generations to come. That America is a free America. That the world, the church, will fight for a world that is a God-loving world. Father, that what is impossible with men is possible with God. And so we say, yes, Lord, and we give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you guys.